Good morning. Good morning. How are you today? I'm doing well. It's good to see you. It's good to see you as well. Thank you so much for agreeing to chat with me. May I ask you to please tell us your name? My name is Aaron Taylor. And is it okay if I call you Aaron? It's perfectly okay. Thank you so much. Will you share a little bit about yourself? Anything you feel comfortable sharing? Sure. Um, again, my name is Aaron Taylor. I'm 32 years old. I reside currently in Columbia, South Carolina. I'm a native of this place, uh, born and raised here. I am a attorney in the uh, local startup community. I'm a startup attorney. I practice corporate governance and corporate transactions. And I'm also the director of the Innovation Lab at Benedict College, a local HBCU in the city as well. Excellent. So I'll ask you a little bit about the lawyer in a minute, but tell me a little bit about Benedict College, how you got there and how did you form the uh, Innovation Lab? Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> so I actually got there through the practice and through my work in the community. I, I've been very... Uh, enamored with the entrepreneurial process since law school. And I wanted to orient my service around enabling people to uh, successfully complete their ventures. So uh, through my legal services, through my community services, all geared towards entrepreneurs, I, I guess, developed a, a bit of a, a standing among my peers in the community. And when the dean of the business school for Benedict College was looking for someone uh, with entrepreneurial experience who was uh, deep in the entrepreneurial and innovative community here, people kept referring her to me. <laughs> and, and, and at first I didn't want the job. I was like, I'm really stoked on my, my practice and I really want to scale it. And uh, things were unwinding, actually, from an entrepreneurial standpoint for me. Uh, I was going through a rocky period in the business. And the opportunity kept coming across my table. And eventually, I humbled myself enough to apply. <laughs> and I got the position. And now That's I'm doing wonderful. it. Yes. Often, when things keep coming back, it's God sending it back to you because there's a reason for it. But that. Yeah certainly doesn't mean you should stop doing your your side hustle until it becomes your primary hustle you know because um, I think what you do and 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 we want to hear all about that in terms of uh, the legal work in startups especially in marginalized communities is so direly needed so how have you found the work at Benedict College do you like it and how do you how do you move through that space do you work with students or you just have a lab where students can come and do various things describe it a little bit it's it's challenging but it's it's really good work um i didn't know such a need for this role existed until i i got here yeah. so again being a native of columbia you have uh, you have a almost prejudicial awareness of the entities in the in the city like usc does this um you know benedict does this millis tech does this and so everyone has a label and uh, i had not gone to a hbcu so this is my first hbcu experience but i was completely surprised by the vibrancy of the students and uh just having almost this this just crazy, unmeasurable energy and passion for learning and expressing themselves. But the, the a lot of the systems and processes here, I think naturally um, are geared towards uh, traditional models of higher education that don't necessarily serve the unique challenges of HBCUs effectively. Right. And and this is where the element of entrepreneurship really adds value because as entrepreneurs, we we add value. We see opportunity in the inefficiencies, 
and we solve problems um, for added value. So being the director of the Innovation Lab and basically, you know, breathing life into the Innovation Lab, this is the first year that it's been that it's been in existence. Um, okay. so Created or was it some other effort that happened? Uh so the dean, the dean, um, she she created it uh, through grant funding, uh, but I I uh, was brought on to to bring it to life. Gotcha. Uh, yes. So I, I've been responsible for its programming, um, for developing its structure and strategic as well as tactical approach. So so yeah, um, the it, it's it's really it's really a, a, a tactical feature of the college in rethinking how to aggregate resources um, at the college, which which are much needed because again, uh, a lot of the processes are are traditional. Yeah, and 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 typically, um, so I'm a technician by trade. I've worked in technology. I think this is my 46th year. I hate to say that because I'm only 19, so I don't know how that math works. But that said, um, black and brown people, women, you know, LGBTQ, I mean, all of these communities suffer with with policies and practices of technology and that there is someone black that is in that space that understands what students experience is a wonderful thing. So go ahead. I'm sorry. No, you know, you're fine. So tell us a little bit about the law part of your career. So um, where did you go to law school? I went to law school actually two places. Uh, I first started at Charlotte School of Law and they had this tragic scandal where the school closed down. And so right at the, I guess, the juncture of whether it was a viable college or a doomed uh, college, I transferred to Charleston School of Law and got my law degree there. Did uh, Charlotte School of Law reopen or did it stay? Uh, oh, no, no, it's closed. It? Wow, that's mm -hmm. amazing. It was really a good uh, a good start. Um, and, and for law uh, in that area, you know, I think they also had a night school too, that, isn't that right? Yes, yeah. ma'am. Yeah, I think I had heard about that. So why law? So when I was young, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I knew I had a lot of interests. That's part of the reason why I think I'm attracted to entrepreneurs and investing in them. Uh but I, I was really torn. Do I want to do business? Do I want to do real estate? Do I want to do something in the community? Do I want to do politics? And when I looked at all those different fields, I always saw an attorney. So I thought to myself, okay, um, let's not necessarily have to uh, box myself in right now, but the common denominator is the attorney. And uh they're the ones with the networks and there's they're the ones with the access. And, you know, I had a skill set, I think, that naturally aligned with that profession. So that's the route I chose. Excellent. And and did you actually practice law or did you when you started your entrepreneurial law firm, was it a part where you practice law or did you serve as a consultant or an advisor? No, my practice is my first foray into practice. The when I graduated law school. Again, I was really interested in um, <clears throat> in law school. I was introduced through to private equity and venture capital, and um, and 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 so I was like, "Wow, this is it! This is really this is really what I'm aiming for." The uh, attorney role is just a, a pathway to get there, but this um, being an investor and an allocator of resources into uh, into ethical and social ventures. That's what I want to do. Uh, and so because of that thinking, after law school, I actually took on an investment management role at the state pension plan. And then once I got uh, some fundamental knowledge there on investment management, I was like, I want to do startup law. But no one in South Carolina was focused on startups and no one in South Carolina um, 
really uh, was hiring a transaction attorney with no experience. So I kind of took a leap of faith and started my own practice to serve that community. So I would like to introduce you to quite a few lawyers uh, who I think you would align with. So I think, you know, I worked at Duke Law for 12, 13 years. I don't know, for a good minute. And no, I didn't yeah, uh, I was the IT person for the law school. Um, but uh, in predominantly white schools, typically they have something called BOSA, Black Law School Associations. Mm-hmm. I don't know if they had that at either the schools you went to, mm-hmm. but uh, Duke has, a, you know, there's a new BOSA class every year, presidents turnover, you know, typically all, and there also, there's also, you know, all the ethnic groups have their own uh, affiliation. Um, but I was closest to the black and brown um, law school association. So I got to know a lot of them. Um, I'm not there anymore, but they stay in touch when I got sick. Uh, they were the loudest crew, you know, screaming, what's wrong, get better. You know, what do you need me to do? And uh, I would say the international law students also were fun. But um, I think that there are quite a few lawyers who you could at least collaborate with, talk to. They may not you all may not be in the same space in terms of where your directions are going, but um, I think it would be good people to have in your network. Um, and I think you yes. will like them uh, a lot. They will like you too. Um, so once you you found that niche, you found out what the thing is. Have you thought any about, since a lot of these services, at least when you started, were not in place, have you thought about going and doing law work for the state? I mean, I understand you did the work for the pension fund, but like, being a lawyer to the state or for the state to look at these kind of issues. So entrepreneurial, venture capitalist, you know, all these things. So um, ever thought about doing that for the state of South Carolina? I have, um, well, you know, it's hard because I really don't know what's down the road. My career really has three branches. There's the, the legal aspect. There's the, um, I guess the nonprofit aspect or the the community aspect, however you want to look at it, because I'm on the board of directors of a pretty prominent nonprofit organization in the state. Uh, We're driving a lot of entrepreneurial and startup growth, and we are uh, a leading voice in the discussion of how do we better serve and develop an innovative community an ecosystem in the Southeast region. So there's that pathway and a lot of doors are opening up there. And then there's also what's opening up at Benedict College. So through the work here, uh, we're quickly becoming a model for how can HBCUs accelerate student competitiveness, especially in these emerging markets that we're seeing uh, with this industrial shift. So, I mean, we've had colleges reaching out to us asking, you know, how we've set things up. And it's only, and I've only been here maybe five or six months. So, yeah. So, and like, honestly, I I was surprised when we got the call because, I mean, to me, I'm just getting started. But I think what differentiates us from a lot of models uh, that are employed in at larger higher ed institutions is that. I'm I'm really following just kind of like a uh, like the Kauffman Foundation's model of ecosystem building, making sure that we're developing the community an entrepreneurial community on campus, but then also aligning those that community's efforts to the broader ecosystem's efforts. So how are we again adding value? so we can become better advocates for resources and for other stakeholders that may not have um, as much impact as we've had. That's so, pretty powerful. Yeah, so so there are three things that are, are pretty promising and right now everything's a, everything's a question mark. I'm just trying to do good work right now. And, and I think you are doing excellent work. Just follow the path. The path will tell you. The question is, is it the path of least resistance or the path of most resistance? You know, <laughs> Um, so you have to figure out which one of those directions you're going. Right. Uh, let, let me ask you this. So does your law practice, your innovative law practice, entrepreneurship practice, does it work specifically with black and brown communities or is, is it to anybody who's had a startup in the state of North Carolina? 
So my law practice serves um, anyone who's geared towards uh, startups and entrepreneurship in South Carolina. Um, okay. Yeah, uh, but but with the Benedict College initiatives, I'm definitely focused on serving uh, minority communities, black and brown communities. Yeah, I, I have three degrees from North Carolina Central. Um, my my doctorate degree is from a predominantly white school, but I love my North Carolina Central experience. I, I tell people you cannot compare an education at a historically black college to a predominantly white, it's day and night, you know, it's just simply day and night, you know, my predominantly white college, that was my seven digit number, that's all, I didn't have a name, didn't have a face, didn't have a voice at, at my historically black college, I was everything, you know, I mean, everything that was happening, I was involved, and I was a non-traditional, I didn't get my first college degree until I was 45, reminding the audience that I'm only 19, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, that was wonderful time. You know, they knew my name when I got sick, when something happened, they called, they went at East Carolina to this day, you know, I'm non-existent other than the check that I sent to them. And I send, I try to send all my money to North Carolina Central because the experience was so positive. My daughter went to a historically black college. She went to Hampton. My son, he went to predominantly white college, but he took a few classes at Central. So try to my husband got his degree from North Carolina Central we try to keep it in the family to, yeah. to support our organizations that you know although we can get to predominantly white colleges now you know for a long time black and brown people did not have that option you know you only could go to a historically black college until you know kids started breaking down barriers but yeah I, you know, I think I, I think it, it and for me I've mulled this question over especially when I when I came to Benedict, you know, there's definitely advantages to the uh, almost familial culture here. Uh, and I think at the same time, it's very important that we, um, that we make sure that, you know, individuals like you, individuals that represent what it means to be, you know, like excellent at the highest levels are represented in the HBCU alumni network. I think that's super important. I agree with you. I, you know, and I think that in the grand scheme of things and in, in the way things have factored out, you know, if you go back, you know, maybe 40, 50 years, we were still on the margins of predominantly white environments. And, mm -hmm. you know, you can look at it in sports in, in the first place, you know, like, you know, there were colleges that did not accept black players would not allow them to play at their school and now those same black kids and their um their evolution now dominate sports um and 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 we've taken all of our attention and time and given it to these predominantly white schools and what do we get in return for that you know uh, yes you might get an education from an ivy league school or a uh, 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 u.s news best colleges but but at what cost you know i mean like it's the same foundational question of black wealth you know how do you make black wealth when um i cannot remember the name of the guys a killer mike i believe he had a television show on uh, netflix and he had a challenge to live black for three days you couldn't eat any food that was not made or cooked by a black person you could not drive a car that was not made or 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 formed by a black person you know all of these things and if you can imagine he could not he could not live three little days just being black you know only supporting black things and when you think about how much they make off for our backs you know for for from slavery to probably the 70s you know, they had their foot on our necks at every turn. You and know, it, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I am. A, a thought occurred to me um, when I started this role at Benedict. I'm engaging in. <clears throat> I'm engaging. I know how to. I know the because of my work with my clients and my practice because of my um, experience in, in with the pension plan, um, 
which had a, a, a pretty much a global investment management network, uh, you get a sense of the, the corporate pace um, that that is perpetuated by white America. But I realized very quickly that my responsibility um, in my practice, how I want to present my practice, uh, but especially how I present entrepreneurship to Black young people has to be considerably different, but at the same time has to prepare them for engaging with that environment and competing in that or with that environment. And so really, I started asking myself questions like, okay, um, why are we doing things this way here? in uh, visiting different startup communities, like actually Durham. Uh, when I learned about Black Wall Street in Durham, and I forget the name of the gentleman, but he he owned, I think, the largest corporate building. It was an insurance in America at the time. I don't know, it was Spalding. Th there are four Black families that are really predominant in Durham. Spalding was one. I'm missing the name of the other three, but um, well, I, I don't, I don't remember his name, but he, it was an insurance company that he built. Uh, Mechanics and Farmers. Yeah, yeah, yes. Mm -hmm. And, and Mechanics and Farmers finally, I think, two years ago, went out of business. I think COVID was the death nail for them because I don't know if you know a lot about them, but they were selling insurance door to door to Black people. Yes. yes, that's um, exactly. But then once once, you know, insurance took a different route, you know, everything was almost done. You know, you go to an insurance or call an insurance agency and you get your life insurance or whatever it is you're trying to get. But right. yeah, I mean, but Durham still maintains. So, hey, Ty, I don't know if you read about that, but hey, Ty, hey, Ty, the, what they did to, in Durham is they ran a highway through hey, Ty. Hey, Ty was a surviving, thriving black community, you know, and they separated that by putting a highway in between wow. and so what remains is the foundational church that was in Haiti, but not very much else of that community around Haiti, there's lots of small little black businesses that some thrive some do not but you know it doesn't look like it used to look at this beautiful thriving you know well-maintained community it's sparse now black people are sparse spread throughout Durham we still are probably 47 46 percent of the population and that's incorporating some brown people as well but um black people still are a pretty prominent group in Durham and uh Raleigh for example our next door neighbor you know they see themselves as a predominantly white community and they see us as you know there's violence and you know there's drugs and all that stuff where they don't see that all that stuff exists in Raleigh as well you know you have violence everywhere you have drugs everywhere it's not a black thing but the way white people write the narrative we're the people on drugs we're the people doing all the killing and crimes and all that stuff and that narrative is incorrect and back to what i was trying to say you know about you know attending and supporting historically black colleges strengthen the foundation of black and brown communities and like and i don't know if this is true in benedict but now at North Carolina Central, we have white students, we have Hispanic students, we have all kinds of students there where once, when I went, I, I my last uh, class at North Carolina Central was in 2007, black, just black. And it's grown exponentially with diver diversification of the student body, but it's still like in the endowment at, at, at Duke is probably close to a billion dollars. The endowment at North Carolina Central is a fraction of that. Yeah. And it's because, you know, we go to a historically black college and we escape and get into the real world and we go to work and we forget about that college that helped you get there. There is like, you know, his predominantly white colleges have spent a lot of time talking about, you know, how they create an infrastructure for student success. In reality, that's a, a, a fallacy. That's not really the case. Historically, Black colleges really do create that. You know, if you start falling down on your grades, bet all the money you have, they're gonna somebody's going to call you and come see about that. Somebody's going to talk to you and find out what's going on. Now, if you decide to stay on that path of not doing well, that's you. But the infrastructure surrounded it, 
you know, you don't have to go to them. They come to you. You know, if your grades are not good, if you are missing classes or whatever, they come to you. And I think that when we get away from our roots and go into the other world, we're just reinforcing what they do to us all the time. So how they kill us, you know, please kill us for arbitrary reasons, you know, people who don't have a correct license tag or someone, you know, didn't put on a turn signal. It's absurd, you know, that someone would die in that experience, you know, even if that person got a ticket or had to go to jail. Okay. But not die because you don't have a license plate tag that's correct for your state. That's insane. So, mm -hmm. black, so, so what you have created with your law firm and your startup, I hope you encourage black and brown people to start a business. I have two businesses right now. I started the first one when Mr. Floyd died. We work on inclusion in the workplace. That's primarily what we do in the first one. And then we teach my second company. We teach marginalized communities the basics so they can get a job in technology. You know, as I think about those kinds of things, we need more of those things. And I'm not a business person. My degrees are in education and psychology and criminal law and all that stuff. It's not being a business person so to have someone like you can go to and ask questions or i'm thinking of starting a business or how much money do i need to start a business do i need to be a for-profit or a non-profit what does those terms mean you know do i need to have a board of directors you know all of these things that marginalized communities are not often faced with you know they don't come across these questions so to have someone like yourself who can go and say hey i want to do this how do i start what do you suggest i do that's a wonderful resource. And I hope you're still doing that on the side. I hope you're keeping your business up. I hope you're keeping your website up so people know where to find you, where they can go get information. You know, they can chat with you. But I hope you're keeping that up because that is such a needed resource. And I will tell you, the people here in Durham, where I am, who do this work, it's like finding a needle in a haystack. They're either unresponsive, they don't have the information, or it's aggregated across the city. And so each person does a little piece and there's no central piece you can go to. If you go with people like the SBA and SBDTC and all those things, they have mandates of how they work. You know, they're more interested in getting you a loan than they are asking you to get into business. So I think that an organization like yours is well needed. The question is, is what do you need to keep that business going and your full-time work because it sounds like your full-time work is offering a lot of opportunities but that business that you have may not be correctly aligned right now but it is so needed so how are you managing those two uh windows if you will you know actually they're they're very well aligned actually um or i'll i'll take a step back because i i want to address what you just talked about and and offer a, a bit of pushback because I think it, there's a need for a balance. And everything that you hit on really points to the unique needs of, of um, minority communities. And so there is there is, there has to be, to your point, an acknowledgement that, okay, our needs are not effectively addressed in the mainstream effort of higher education. However, I think that we also need to look at our students holistically. And so, and, and this is this is really, and I and I, I guess I see almost like a mirror image of myself in some of these students. Uh, so I went to a PWI and predominantly white. Institution. Yes, and uh, and it, it did well for me because of its name, not because of the education that I was uh, given, and definitely not for the development of my self-image. Talk. And, Talk. and I think that this is where HBCUs are really filling in the gap for uh, Black students. And that is, unfortunately, Black students, uh, because of generational systematic oppression, are facing a deficit. And so before we can hope to, to, to really be 
to really walk in the fullness of who we are amongst um, amongst uh, whether they be uh, our collaborators, our competitors. If we're really going to participate in global markets, there first has to be a fundamental addressing of who we truly are. And, I, and that's how we started this conversation with it and how we got into Durham because I, I've started researching black business history, yeah. you know, and, and to your point, we have been literally the innovators and the linchpins to the economic development of United of the United States. Agricultural um, practices, best agricultural practices were developed by slaves. I'm reading a book right now and they and the slaves, there was one instance I had, I had to chuckle to myself because it just shows how keenly interested we are in doing things properly. When they brought slaves from certain regions, they purchased them based off of their agricultural needs. Right. So like I'm I'm going to get a slave that that is from a region that herds cattle if I'm a rancher. I'm going to get slaves from a region that that is experienced in planting rice if I'm a planter. And so when they brought these, for instance, when they brought these slaves to America, they would give the slaves like their European agricultural tools. And the slave said, no, we're like, we, a plow is going to damage the land. We'll hoe it by, we'll hoe the land by hand to ensure that there's adequate produce. And this wasn't for the benefit of the master, but the slaves realized that if we don't produce, if we don't maximize and, and make this the most efficient processes ever, there will definitely not be enough for us to eat and for us to share and, and to trade. So they literally had to push themselves to the edge of innovation to, to ensure that, that at least a, 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 a modicum of economic prosperity existed for their survival. Right. And, and it's absolutely crazy that, you know, we, you know, there's so much pride in what America is. And, and you hear, you hear it in the songs and in the imagery. And it's like all these things that cultivated, you know, um, these industries were based off of African economic practices. Absolutely. And, and and to further your point, I mean, like, even while we were enslaved, we were creative and innovative all the time. You know, yes. half the things that they think about and, and know today started with a foundation of us, which is why I think there's so much animosity in the in the the division between races, right? So, you know, white people as a whole, you know, I think they've done some pretty amazing things in these various revolutions, but on whose back, you know, the economic structure of America, on whose back, you know, everything we know about what's wrong and right in our society, we know because we have seen what we have done and how innovative we are. One of my favorite things, I tell people this all the time. You have a baby, everybody gets these little backpack looking things. They stick the kid in it and carry it around on their back or on their chest. And I remember, you know, African people don't have the luxury of someone designing an, an outfit like that, you know, or designing a gadget like that. So they just take cloth and wrap the baby around, either around their back and their front. And the baby is secure and comfortable, even goes to sleep. Whereas that innovation came from what they saw in Africa. And, mm. and to me, when you think about us as a whole, we are innovative, creative people. We could not have been free without white people. The problem just is, is that jealousy or envy or whatever that thing is that exists between black and white causes such divisions in our society that it's almost explosive, you know, like, why do you hate someone because of the color of their skin? There's nothing logical about that because 
in your own family, and speaking to white people now, in your own family, there was black people there. I had a friend of mine do the ancestry DNA test. He was 11% of African descent. It, it, it listed a whole bunch of different things, like one, 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 but 11%. And I wonder if they all did that, would they find out who they really are? Like this, this, this thing you break or put in between us about the color of our skin, the texture of our hair, you know, our hips and lips and all those different things. What difference does it make? Because who you are is not those things. Who you are is how you are on the inside and how you present yourself to others. Mm -hmm. I just think that, you know, for the work that you do, and I hope you continue doing both. I hope you find out the thing in the, in the higher ed, but I also hope you find out how to, you know, get out here and change how companies come to fruition and, you know, where that help is, you know, like, you know, is there a list of resources that people can find you say, oh, well, you know, I want to do this. I can talk to him because I think that you need a presence so people know where to find you. It's not obvious for us where to go because these things are dense. So the first place we go when we think about creating a business is SBA or SBDTC. It's like, but those places are not geared to us. You know, they're not designed for us, if you will. They're helpful and all that stuff. But the learning curve to understand whether you're being cheated or, or getting yourself into something more than you want to is high. So there needs to be an Aaron Taylor that's available for everyone, not just those in South Carolina or that you create. Like a friend of mine here in North Carolina created uh, Black Doctors in White Coats. I thought mm -hmm. that was beautiful. So why can't there be... Uh, black entrepreneur startup attorneys or so, so yeah so I, I think that ties back into your previous question and i'm sorry i didn't uh completely answer it but i i had to again take a step back and and say okay Aaron, um between benedict college and your law practice there's too much mental transition that um yeah. you you're having to do uh you you have to be kind of like an educator and program director here and you and then here you have to put on your attorney hat and two different minds right so but what i realized so so how do we make this uh process more efficient and more aligned and i'm, I'm looking at all the things that i do uh with the nonprofit groco here uh in columbia and with benedict college and, and even with the practice and i thought okay I'm responsible for developing three organizations. And honestly, like, you know, if I do say so myself, I'm I'm establishing myself in, in these roles. I'm I'm doing okay. Like things are moving along. So with my practice, I had to make a mental shift. And that mental shift was uh stop trying so hard to be a practitioner and focus more so on this natural strength that you have that's developing very well of being an organization builder. So now that has challenged me, <clears throat> that mindset shift has challenged me to think about my practice differently, right? Because when I came in, as I mentioned, uh, the practice was my first foray into actual legal practice, and there was a lot of insecurity um, tied up in it. How much How much am I worth? Um, how much value am I adding to my clients with my limited experience? Um, and, um, I, I, I want to create a name for myself as a good attorney to kind of like, you know, just match my peers who are in established law firms. So I wanted to be an attorney, you know? And everything that that meant, a good practitioner. And I have since taken a step from that, that that desire to prove myself as a legal professional. And I have aligned Cedar Tree Law Firm, that's the name of my practice, Cedar Tree Law Firm, with my, my broader role, which is to be a, a community builder and an organization builder and a service provider. So what that looks like is I, I brought on interns to help me with the technical practical, uh, practic the, like the practical side of the practice mm -hmm. and, and uh, allow them to do the brunt of the research and me just uh, kind of like arrange the work. 
uh, and take some time out to focus on how to rethink this law firm, this law practice to actually be a community builder rather than simply a legal service provider. I love and, that. Yes. Yes. So tell me this. Um, I'm looking for something to send to you that I cannot find. I just found it. Um, tell me this. So in the uh, in in this process that you use for doing this, how how are you marketing it? How is your outreach? And I realized that you know, living with two feet and two full full capacity things, um, how are you how are you marketing it? How do people learn more? So uh, right now, I, 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 I've been, uh, I think, very good at opening up the practice to the community. So I, I lean in heavily on mentors. But again, because I'm so busy, I haven't been in a, in a rush to just uh, get it off the ground, get it all out there. I mean, it's off the ground, but uh, to really push it. Uh, one thing I am doing is and again just aligning the practice with community building um once a month i'm going to be visiting different startup communities and just to and i can do a, a few things there i'm going to be promoting my my practice but i'm also going to be learning what are the best practices here like where where are you all falling short in your entrepreneurial community uh is it diverse what are you doing to to advocate for uh BIPOC aspiring entrepreneurs and established founders because they're there. Uh, they're just... Can I just interrupt one second? Mm -hmm, sure. So BIPOC. So the same thing, and this goes, I, I, I often get into trouble with this, but people of color is all people. Open your crayon box and look. There's black, white, blue, mm -hmm. green, all the colors are there. So when people use the word BIPOC and people of color, they're trying to marginalize uh, mar black and brown communities. I, and somebody asked me the other day, well, you know, people get offended if they can't be known by these these terms. But think about why these terms come into existence. So they're further categorizing people that have already been categorized, right? So so now I'm a person of color. I'm a, a, a you know, these terms that are not necessarily inclusive. They're more exclusive, you know, to call somebody a, a person of color or to say someone's BIPOC or you know, you're excluding versus including, you know, That's so, good point. you know, I just, just say that if you, if you can, you know, avoid, you know, giving those in power, more power to marginalize you or to, to categorize you, you know, so you're a person of color. Every time someone tells me that I say all people are people of color, we all fall in that umbrella. You can't, if you want a category that just black and brown, say black and brown, if you want to put us in that, but don't say people of color in a way to exclude yourself. So you're not that. So person of color normally means somebody that's black or brown. Person of color is someone that's a human being. Sorry. No, you're right. Thank you. I appreciate that knowledge. But uh, yeah, how are we how are we serving minorities? How are we serving Black people? And um, and the entrepreneurs that that are looking to compete, they're looking for the same resources. They're looking for venture capital funding. They're looking for accelerator programs, and and not just and again. I think this is why I'm, I'm, I'm really starting to develop a chip on my shoulder looking at being a part of entrepreneurial development because the needs of a black founder are just like, you know, we see in our students, the conversation of the, the HBC versus the PWI benefits, there's a different need for the black founder just as the, just as there is a different need for the black student. And we have to, as effective ecosystem builders in the innovative space, have to be able to acknowledge this and have to be able to incorporate elements and features into our programming and our initiatives that are geared towards on-ramping uh, Black founders and minority founders. It's, it's at absolutely essential. We need a level of empathy, sympathy, and consciousness 
that that addresses the community holistically, and that includes minority entrepreneurs and founders. Yep, so, absolutely. So that's I, what, yeah. So that's what kind of like visiting these different communities is supposed to be like a, a research point and an advocacy point for. Yeah, I think that that's wonderful, and I hope you keep doing this. And there's something you need me to do. I am more than happy to do so for you. Uh, you can come bring your business to North Carolina, specifically in the Durham, Raleigh, Durham area. We need it. So if you decide that you want to be a traveling lawyer, come <laughs> on down or come on up, whatever it is. But uh, we look forward to this. I really appreciate you chatting with me today. Um, I hope you will chat with me again and keep me posted on how you're doing and let us know what we can do to help you. Yes, ma'am. It's been a pleasure. It really has been. I mean, you're such an amazing person. I'm so happy I've gotten to know you. Um, and, you know, I'm in your corner. You can always count on me to be in your corner. Thank you. I, I appreciate okay. you. Really. I, I will send you a link to this chat. Please listen. Make sure it's okay. And let me know if I may upload it. And uh, I, I I stand with you. I, I like the fight. Fight on. I'm, I'm right there with you. We're working. We're, work we're working. We're working. It's, it's, it's getting there. Absolutely. And I'm going to start telling some of these people I know, hey, I know a guy in South Carolina might be able to give you some business advice. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much, Aaron. I will talk to you again soon. Thank you. Dr. Rochelle, thank you so much. You take care of yourself. I'm so <laughs> proud of you. So, so proud of you. Thank you. That means a lot. Absolutely. Do that thing. You know, we yes, all want to see that happen. So do that. Yes, ma'am. Yes, Bye. Ma